learn about it, I think is the biggest challenge. Because I think most policymakers, you know, I mean, by and large, our policymaking bodies are composed of old men. Um, they're, they're not necessarily in touch with what youth is thinking about. They're not necessarily in touch with what's already happening. Um, and we see that repeated over and over and over again. Congressional hearings on MySpace are probably coming up. We've already had the congressional hearings on the video games. Before that, it was labeling on rock and roll or whatever. Um, it's really important to stay in touch with what people are actually doing until the day when our senators are all text messaging you know, under the table as they're listening for legislation. They're not going to understand what the cultural climate really is. Um, this is a problem that fixes itself over time, but it's still important that before making big decisions now, they take the time to educate themselves about what they're deciding on. Empowerment, diversity, creativity. Um, you know, I don't believe in a future that is the um, centralized content creators, the you know, the big business bodies pushing the content down. I don't think that that is really a viable business model. I mean, it just in terms of the expense of creating the content and so on. And I also believe that. You know, humanity started out still in telling stories to each other around campfires, playing music in the evenings in the parlors, and, and you know, sharing their creativity with friends and with family. And I think that really that's been a lot of the trend. I think that a lot of historical trends pushed us towards moving apart from one another in many different ways. And I think that the networked environment is actually allowing us to move closer together again and share some of those things that we didn't have before. My biggest fear, actually, is that humans grew up in tribes where you didn't get to pick who else was in your tribe. We grew up in situations where we had to learn to get along with people who had opinions that were different from ours. And network technologies are allowing us to form tribes that are homogenous. They're allowing us to find groups of people who are just like us. And I think it's wonderful that I can find my tribe of people who read the same books I do and like my music and, you know, uh, you know, watch the same TV shows and in general share my particular view of the world. That's wonderful because it makes you feel like you're not alone anymore. But on the other hand, I think it's inc incredibly important for the human race to uh, be exposed to multiple viewpoints and to get to uh, interact with people that ne we wouldn't necessarily interact with given our choice. I think that one of the things that is a real risk in the networked environment is that the, the lessened friction of connecting with people you know, people will choose to hang out with people they already know. They'll choose to read the books they already know they'll like, rather than taking a flyer on something new. And um, statistical analysis shows that this is the case when we look at, um, you know, all of the communities of interest that are formed on the internet. You can graph, for example, what political books people read on Amazon, and what you find is Democrats won't read the right-wing books and the Republicans won't read the left-wing books and almost no books cross the divide and are read by both and that's a very dangerous thing for our, for our political establishment so um, that would be my worry about this low friction information culture because you know biology teaches us homogenous cultures are not a good thing they're very vulnerable You know, I think it's, it's not going to be something regarding networking. I think that the things that, to me, are really um, startling and amazing that are coming down the pike in technology that will be beyond the 10-year horizon are in biotech, they're in nanotech, you know. They're not in just hardware, and they're not just in, in network connectivity. Um, you know, we're going to have things like, you know, the, the public object that is broadcasting its state and all of that kind of thing. But where it really starts to get weird, honestly, is um, particularly in biotech as we start doing really interesting things with, uh, you know, curing some long-standing diseases. You know, I think uh, diabetes, for example, is one of the ones that I would put on the list is, you know, it's on the hit list, thank goodness, for the next couple decades. Um, real strides are being made on a variety of other things, cancer and so on. 
and what that'll do to lifespan and then to the economics of the world is uh, extremely interesting. What starts happening with essentially bio enhancements of various sorts and uh, the things that we can do with nanotechnology, uh, those to me are, are the things that are really disruptive beyond connectivity. Most of the extrapolation that I think we do on connectivity such assuming more of the same, but I think the interesting thing is what happens when the bones in your eardrum are spitting out an RSS feed. Now we're talking, now we're in the realm of the weird. You know, I'd have to go with something that was really ubiquitous, right? I mean, when, when you look today at the impact that something like the cell phone had or the web, um, both those things have really infiltrated into daily life in, in ways that were inconceivable 10 years ago. Um, I think that um, in the next 10 years, we're going to see more convergence of web onto mobile, and that that's going to have a very big impact. Um, you know, everything from uh, you know, the geospatial web and annotation of the real world to um, constant connectivity always on, uh, people always knowing where to find you. I think probably the thing that will freak out everybody is the amount of personal data that is going to be readily available to everybody all the time. But I think that most people will trade that for the convenience of being able to carry their phone around um, and have it also be their credit card. And I think something as simple as that is, is the kind of thing that will happen slowly enough. People won't necessarily feel like the world changed around them, but that in practice is going to have just tremendous impact on the way people live their lives. Unpredictable. Um, <laughs> it's um, you know, it's it's buffeted by so many winds of change in so many different directions. It's hard to foresee what kinds of convergence might happen. Um, you know, if there's a breakthrough in nanotech, all bets are off. I mean, it could be anything. Um, so it's it's really hard to really predict technological trends. And you know, we start seeing things being used in radically different ways, right? When um, when the news broke a while back that some Japanese scientists had developed a self-cleaning fabric for sweaters, you know, it was a yarn that ate, you know, biological particles, um, my friend Bruce Sterling immediately said, oh, I can't wait to write a story about the first lawsuit when somebody's sweater ate their cat, right? That's the way that technology actually works, right? It isn't so much about, oh, look, and now the laundry business is damaged. No, it's about the weird right angles turn that things take. Um, and to me, that's the really interesting thing. That, and that's where, you know, it's a chaotic system. You can't really predict it.